What's up, everybody? We are back. This is Big Riff Energy, episode 19. All the fan mail that I got regarding the last episode mentioned something about honesty. That seems to be the, the topic at hand. So I'll go ahead and start there. Got an email from uh, Renee, who is at the show in Denton, the Midnight Spirit of Drift Spider show in Denton. Um, yeah, just thank me for keeping it real. Renee, I'm pretty sure you're the dude that bought me a Topo Chico, if I'm not mistaken. I like your vibe, bro. <laughs> I like your vibe. You're a cool guy. Thank you, Renee. Uh, I got similar emails from another couple of people and then uh eric uh i won't drone on about honesty but he mentioned that and then uh being somebody who has never toured i wonder what the perils are when a tour is announced too late my immediate thought is attendance will suffer but what other troubles can arise uh and then he sort of talks about just the general issues i mentioned on the last podcast with inflation and infrastructure and all that stuff um yeah, so first of all, the honesty thing, I, I appreciate it. I'm not that way uh, to get props, although I do appreciate it. I, I thank you guys for putting respect on it, but it's just um, I've been thinking about honesty and especially uh, like public persona. Um, I'm not really a public figure, but, you know, when you're in the – I guess music biz or whatever you're on a stage and you have social media and stuff like that. And I feel like for a lot of people, a big part of that is curating an image and stuff like that. Um, I've never been about that. And I was, I've been, since I got these emails, I've been thinking about why that is or what made me that way or whatever. A big thing that contributed to that. If you're just listening, I'm holding up a copy of get in the van by Henry Rollins. Um, you want to talk about honest, man. The, you know, people kind of cool punkers type people, they sort of knock Rollins for like ruining Black Flag or whatever, um, bringing in the macho element or the frat boy element or the super testosterone element or whatever, which I think is total bullshit. And I just, I honestly think most of those people are just jealous of him for whatever reason, <laughs> lots of things to be jealous of with that guy. But, um, he pours his guts out in this. Th I mean, it's basically very mildly edited journal entries. I think from like 1980 or so, probably like 79 basically started right as he was joining black flag 81 right there starts in spring of 81 um, I got in a black flag when I was probably 15 or 16. And I remember at some point reading an interview with, uh, Jeff Morgan, the drummer of wake from little rock. He did an interview with our buddy that was writing for the paper in little rock at the time. And he talked about like how Hank Williams was the heaviest shit in the world. And because of the realness and the honesty and I remember, I think it was also an interview with him talking about how they're, they're spiritually or whatever, there's no real difference between stuff like Hank Williams and, and punk and stuff. It's all about uh, feeling like out of step, as Minor Threat would say, or just um, being in your feelings, you know, whether it's anger or uh, whatever. That's kind of the common one, anger or heartache, stuff like that. Uh, but I got into... Country music when I was younger, obviously, because everybody was playing it. And someone once famously called country music three chords in the truth, right? So there's the truth thing, the honesty thing. And I got into Black Flag, like I said, probably around 15 or 16. And I remember I was uh, going through some heavy shit with a, a girl for like a year. <laughs> and uh, I was running every day and I would listen to Black Flag, My War, front to back, and Hank Williams' Greatest Hits, front to back. And I was reading Get in the Van around the same time. And this, I, I, 
this isn't even really a book. It's definitely not like a novel or anything like that. So I think it's a stretch to even call it a book. But if it is a book, I would have to say it's the most important book that I've ever come across in my life. There were some others that really uh, affected me profoundly for the rest of my life. You know, On the Road by Jack Kerouac was a big one. And all the Bukowski stuff when I was younger, Jimmy Bauer turned me on to that stuff. But dude, get in the van, like... I'm still in the van. Uh, it worked. It worked on me. And I don't know how. Um, like I said, I haven't really read this since I was a kid, but I have this bookmark in like a random spot. 20 bucks spin sticker. Endless eternal hails to a 20 bucks spin. But I, I just, so I flipped to a random page earlier today just to see, you know. And this entry makes me well, I'll just read it. Uh, February 14th, 83 is in Hamburg, Germany. Played last night in Hanover. Real good show. So we're starting high, right? The place was small and packed. The air was mostly smoke, so it was hard to breathe. Played a 24-song set. We kept going off, and Dukowski kept saying to play more. Fine with me. It was hard, though. Me and Bill kept grinning at each other because we knew how the other was hating the heat. Pulled it off, though. The gig here was at a place called the Markthal. A lot of people, a lot of really fucked skinheads. Watt, he's talking about Mike Watt, who's kind of getting on his nerves at this point in the tour. Watt got mugged at the bar when they heard his American accent. When we played, the skins were all up front telling us to go home, pushing people around. They kept swinging at my head, and when I got too close to the edge of the stage, or they kept swinging at my head when I got too close to the edge of the stage. Finally, I asked the crowd how many of them thought that the skins were assholes. The place cheered. The skins shrank back and just stared. I played hard. I poured myself out. I feel like a dry sponge. You can play until you drop and no one cares. There's a lot they'll never know. I don't want the things they tell me to want. I'm losing all hope for people. I don't feel like writing anymore. I, <laughs> I hate everything and I'm lonely and I think there's no way out destroyed by the eyes of the world now remember the fucking entry starts with played last night in hanover real good show and by the end he <laughs> he's given up complete and total hope for humanity and um this thing is just like a, a journey man it changed my life it, it made me wonder what that's like and it, it just like it was so exciting reading that as a kid and listening to live Black Flag stuff and trying to find interviews with him. The interview where he's on acid and he's like freaking out on the kid. Um, the honesty that he showed in this, you know, it, it made an impression, man. And it, like I said, the country music thing, three chords and the truth, you know, that made an impression. I was watching a Muddy Waters documentary the other day and some guy defined the blues as a voice in the southern darkness complaining about the human condition and man that was all just like going into my mind you know just keeping it real like how how do you expect to keep it real as an artist if you don't as a person like if you're full of shit as a person you can fake it in your music for so long, but eventually people aren't going to give a shit. Not that that matters. I think there's like an even more, there's a duty as a human being as an, and as an artist to just be real. Um, I don't give a shit about people or music or anything else that I think is like contrived or um, artificial, disingenuous. I, I don't know. I think another factor that I've noticed is like people who have gone through real tough shit and come out the other side. It's like you lose a capacity for trying to please people or whatever. Um, and I'm in a business where, I mean, the reason bands have managers and stuff like that is because part of the deal when you're dealing with like interpersonal politics and stuff like that, is you have to bullshit people and kiss ass and stuff like that. Uh, but the best ones don't, I think. Like, I don't think Peter Grant back in the day was kissing anybody's ass for Led Up, and I think he was telling them exactly what fucking time it was, and they listened to him, 
you know so i'm i'm about that shit once again thanks to everyone for for mentioning something about that but it's the way i am also i I think it's just less work to not be full of shit like it takes it takes too much energy at least for me to try to like be something other than exactly what i'm feeling at the time so that's it that's it on that whole topic man but uh, I couldn't just ignore it because everybody said something about it, which is cool. Um, Eric also mentioned something about, oh, yeah, um, what are the issues when a tour is announced too late? Just all kinds of bullshit, like people, not enough people knowing about it. You know, even like friends of ours not knowing that we were in town, stuff like that. And, uh, promoters um, want to change financial stuff at the last minute, which negatively affects everybody that showed up and did their job you know so yeah just a lot of bullshit so yeah like i said in the last one i'm going to a three months in advance thing um i think if something's not put together three months in advance of the first show is probably not worth doing honestly so three months man new rule eric uh and others also mentioned the list thing and put some bands on there. A bunch of people mentioned uh, Sumerlands. I used to say Summerlands, but I think it's actually like Sumeria, like Sumerlands. Uh, that would be f- rad. Dylan, our merch guy who's listening to this right now, is like nodding his head as hard as he can because <laughs> he's been talking about that for a while. Um, I love that band. I love Arthur. I, I don't know the other guys too well. But I really love Arthur and really respect him and love that band. That would for sure be cool. They're definitely on the list. Um, a lot of peace people also mentioned Tribulation. They're on the list. So those were two bands that a lot of you mentioned that, yeah, they're on there. I love that new Tribulation EP. Their new guitar player is like a badass, man very uh it's the most compelling and impressive lead guitar that i've heard this year on that tribulation ep super cool so that's it for fan stuff uh papa kirk man kirk winstein put out a new song today he's got a new band i am e-y-e am and uh it's half crowbar half typo negative so it's him and Todd Strange and then uh, Johnny and Kenny from Typo Negative. And I had a certain expectation in my mind when imagining a band that's half Crowbar and half Typo Negative, I thought it would sound like that. Uh, and it doesn't at all. I was like really surprised, especially by the first half of the track. Uh, but it's real good, man. And then that halfway mark goes to Kirk and he plays a a Kirk riff, man. It's one of his best. It's got every, uh, you know, eventually you develop your own riff style as a guitar player. His is pretty obvious. He's got uh, obvious, not in a bad way. It's obvious as in the way that like Tony Iommi has an obvious style. You know, there's like a, there are things that he uses throughout his career that are just his personality, right? I'm talking about Kirk. Uh, and halfway point of this song, he busts out one of those riffs and it's like just perfect, man. The man just writes perfect riffs. Like so many of his riffs are just perfect. They resolve exactly how you hope they would. Or if there's a surprise, it's like, holy shit, that's like the coolest possible thing you could have gone to at that point in the riff. And it's one of them for sure. It's somewhere between, I don't know. It's just like, it's like every badass riff he's ever written all in one riff um the vocals are killer you know uh the band we were talking about it and it was like yeah somewhere between sabbath and sound garden there's like some ozzy nicole heard ozzy and like yeah a little bit of chris cornell on like the super high stuff good stuff man and um life's a trip dude life is a trip because i just got on my phone and texted Kirk Winstein, who's just one of my heroes, you know, and had a really uh, cool exchange with him 
we're going to be seeing them uh, like in a week and a half at Hellfest. We're playing on the same stage, like almost back to back. Looking forward to that. But um, man, I just I wanted to talk about Kirk for a minute. Uh, it's just it's such a trip, and I feel so grateful and like it's a corny word, but blessed to be able to like have a guy like that who I looked up to so much my whole life and now we're buds, you know, it's like, that's, uh, I was talking last week about motivation and, you know, the connection with you guys and the fans and stuff. That's like number one. Uh, but a close contender for motivation is, is when a guy like Kirk is into what I'm doing and vice versa. It's just like, there's no better feeling than that. No better feeling. It's so surreal. Um, I, I just have so many memories attached to his music and you know whether it's like running away from the adults during a high school trip to go see crowbar like unaccompanied and they get this tattoo <laughs> when i was 17 years old illegally um you know that that was also like the first time i saw weed eater right and dixie had like the bottle of robitussin duct tape to the Mike stand with a straw <laughs> it's like being a kid and just having your mind blown by that and then the same tour you know I saw saw the same tour package in Tulsa that year and uh this is when Crowbar was like really partying really partying they had Steve Gibb and Pat Bruders in the band at the time and the the amps were just a wall of liquor and beer and Kirk walked up to the mic and did the signature. We're crowbar. We're from New Orleans, Louisiana. We're going to kick your fucking ass. But when he said ass, he projectile vomited all over the place. And dude, for the whole first two songs, he was nailing it. And just puke and shit was flying out of his mouth. <laughs> Amazing. When you're a teenager, that's like just incredible, man. Uh, seeing down growing up, you know. Uh I, it's just like strange random memories attached to that dude's music too. Like um, wearing a long sleeve life's blood for the downtrodden shirt. When I got like some of the heaviest news of my life, just walking out the door with that shirt on. I just remember, I'm sure I've ordered that shirt like directly from the band or something. Uh, that's a record that is like severely underrated, by the way, 2005, really good one. Um, and you know, I was, I was looking through their discography and I, I did this exercise when I was working on our new record where I started in 1970 and I went to the present and wrote down, try to figure out what my 10 favorite albums were for every year. And if there was 12 or whatever, fine. Um, and it was a really interesting exercise to see like, Every year, what resonated with me and what resonated with society at large and pop culture and stuff like that. Uh, after about 1990, there was barely any intersection between what I liked and what most people liked. Um, but it also gave me an opportunity to see where there were like pretty objective, obvious lulls in rock music and heavy music and stuff like that. And then you look at Crowbar's discography and they just didn't care. They didn't care. It's just a, rec a good record, year and a half, good record, year and a half, good record, two years, good record, year and a half, good record. The biggest gap was between 05 and 11, Life's Blood and Sever the Wicked Hand, which Sever the Wicked Hand might be the best Crowbar record. Uh Robin Kirk's wife likes that one a lot too. Tommy Buckley likes that one a lot too. Really good. Um, your boy just didn't stop. He just didn't stop. He didn't give a shit what was going on. Still doesn't. Not in a bad way. Not in an elitist way. He just likes what he likes. He makes the music he likes. And dude, it's so inspiring. Uh, I freaking love that guy. Um, you know, it was his birthday not that long ago. Jamie Josta shouted him out on uh, social media and said, this dude is our Lemmy and he is Kirk Winstein is our closest thing to Lemmy. He'll never let us down. Never let us down. 
just keeps trucking and keeps like making really kick ass heavy music. Uh, one of the best riff writers. I need to stop. I'm just going to go on and on. One thing I was a little scared, and I told him this when his solo record came out, and I saw there was an Aqualung cover on there. I'm like, how the fuck is he going to make Aqualung by Jethro Tull work? And dude, I don't even like the original all that much. And he, I mean, he just crushed it. He just had in his mind exactly how it was going to work and just fearlessly like crushed that cover. Amazing. I like it more, than, way more than the original, honestly. Um, what a guy. So yeah, he's got that new band, I Am. Uh, I'm excited to hear the rest of that stuff. And yeah, it's just, um, you know, like Rollins was writing in that one journal entry in, in Hamburg, Germany. He's just like, you can feel him. He's probably started writing when the adrenaline was still going like, holy shit, that was a great show. And then by then he just is like, what the fuck am I doing here? I want to die. I hate everybody. <laughs> I'm lonely. I fucking hate this. And, uh, that's our business, baby. And that's how I've been feeling. But, uh, today was cool getting to talk to Kirk. It's just like, boom, one little thing like that, bam, right back on top. Um, so yeah, the honesty thing and the keeping it real with your music and doing what you do, get in the van and Kirk Winstein, that all somehow connects, you know, uh, I want to talk about this new record by Witch Hazel. Uh, it's her fourth record. It's called Sacrament. Uh, it's incredible. It's really good. My favorite record last year was uh, the Helos record. I forget the name of Island of something. Isle of Wisdom. Um, this was sort of kind of in the same wheelhouse on paper, you know, in the general sense of like clean vocals, lots of vocal harmonies, really good emotional uh, vocal melodies and thin Lizzy harmonies and uh, lots of dynamics and great compelling songwriting and all of that sort of stuff. This band has been on my radar for quite a while. Uh, and I liked, I've always liked them when I've heard them, uh, especially the last album. I think that's the first time I really took note. The one with the sword on the covers, like stuck in a hay bale or something. Um, and I jammed that record, and I have to admit, this makes me an asshole. I was, like, getting really into them, and then I saw they kind of have, like, a renaissance fair thing going on, and I just kind of stopped there. And I'll admit when I was wrong, man. Uh, I shouldn't care that much how bands look. I'm not a costume guy or a mask guy or anything like that. There's bands that pull that shit off. Midnight, for sure. I tell everybody that when you see Midnight on stage you're seeing the real people and when you see them off stage that's their costume you know uh, and there's tons of bands and artists that i think are that way um you can't like scream in somebody's face checking out at the grocery store so you put on a bullet belt and a jacket and scream at somebody's face on a stage right um so yeah i i strongly urge you to check out the new witch hazel album and support them go buy it on their band camp or wherever stream it um there's not enough bands like straight up not enough metal bands or rock bands or hard rock bands or whatever with clean vocals or hooks or like really good guitar solos that aren't just jacking off all over the place and showing off um this record's really cool it's everything cool about old production, but it doesn't sound intentionally lo-fi. It's not attempting to be vintage in like a lo-fi um, regressive kind of way. You know, it's a really high quality recording, but it's just, I don't know. It's got a vibe. It's got an old vibe. Um, bands like Witch Hazel and High Loss to me are kind of like, why I liked Ghost when they first came out. I'm not so into the last Ghost album. Um, I'm kind of like hot and cold with their catalog, to be honest. And there's a lot of other bands doing that kind of stuff that are really killing it right now that might not have the same pizzazz. You know, they're doing their thing. Halas wears capes, and these guys wear like the Friar Tuck shit. And, uh, you know, but they, they can't afford like whatever cathedrals and shit just yet. Um, 
So let's try and get them there, man. We got ghosts there. Let's let's go out and buy this Witch Hazel album and jam it. Uh, I'm going to do a rare thing right now. I'm crack my knuckles. I'm talking about two records. Second one, I don't have a vinyl copy of it because I don't even think they ever repressed it. Cheapest one is like 100 bucks. But I'm going to talk about Permission to Land by The Darkness, 2003. I was 15 when this came out. I was talking earlier about um, writing all my favorite records of every year or whatever. And yeah, you see some lulls, man. And 2003 was a weird time. You know, that's the period of time where Kirk Hammett got convinced not to play guitar solos on a record. Uh, everybody was like, bleaching their hair and spiking it in the front and stuff. And they all like, everybody was doing that. They all looked the same, uh, which I've never understood that, you know, there's, I've seen so many waves of that. At one point, everybody was like Johnny biker, you know, discovering sleep and electric wizard and like traditional tattoos. And that was the thing. But back in 2003, it was like new metal, y bleach blonde hair and, crap like that. Kirk Hammett wasn't playing guitar solos. There were some bands slugging it out in the underground, you know, high on fire was around. I think they put out, I think surrounded by thieves came out in Oh two and blessed black wings came out in Oh four. So they were out there, you know, slugging it out for like real actual metal music. There were a few other bands. I think Baroness was coming up in 2003, right? Mastodon, um, but it was still like real underground. Uh, Mastodon, nobody really knew who they were. Nobody really knew who High on Fire was. Uh, Relapse Records was kind of like single-handedly keeping badass heavy music going during that time. But in the mainstream, no, no sir. Nothing cool. Nothing cool. That reminds me a lot of a period that we're going through. Uh, and then these dorks showed up with <laughs> these animals showed up with long hair looking like freaks, man, just wearing the freakiest, like over the top, like Elton John, David Bowie, queen type shit. And uh, a wall of martial amps, full on wall of martial amps and heavy Les Pauls and long hair and hard serious drug and alcohol abuse <laughs> just like firing on all cylinders get like this band is the definition of these go to 11 uh, i'll never forget walking into hastings it was this cd and book and magazine store and seeing that and i believe kerrang of all things had given it like the five out of five or whatever uh this is before they started only talking about machine gun Kelly and shit like that. But, uh, I remember just like seeing the hype sticker and reading the reviews and everything. That was really the only way you could find out if something was cool. And you had to trust, you actually had to trust like music critics at the time. Imagine that it's hard, hard to fathom, but I bought the CD and just like blew my head off, blew my head off. Uh, it took me a long time to like ACDC. I grew up with this dude, Ryan, and he would keep, I would talk shit to him about ACDC all day long. They're boring. They suck. Every song sounds the same. Same old shit I hear from everybody that doesn't like ACDC. Uh, like I said, I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. And Ryan just kept burning me CDs of different ACDC mixes. And he burned me one and I'll never forget uh, Night Prowler. I was like, oh shit. Oh man. Uh, you know, they named the, Richard Ramirez as a night stalker after that song because he wore the ACDC hat. I was like, okay, hearing that down payment blues and uh, really anything off of Power Ridge, I was like, whoa, this man's badass. Okay. So by the time this Darkness record came out, I, I got ACDC. I liked Queen good enough and Zeppelin. Um, the Darkness had Thin Lizzy guitar harmonies, so I was way way into thin lizzy already uh but just the dude the guitar tones it was a huge 
fuck you to everything that was going on. And I was saying fuck you to everything that was going on at the time too. So I felt very vindicated and I felt seen by these guys. Uh, and you can talk all you want about how it's like corny, cheesy, goofy, sticky, spinal tappy, whatever. Spinal tap has badass songs too. Spinal tap face value is like a pretty badass band when they were in their prime, you know? And I feel like the darkness was like a real life spinal tap with heavier riffs and like really ripping solos. I'll never forget seeing them on late night TV and Justin was singing and then I expected his brother to play the guitar solo and Justin stepped back from the mic and ripped the guitar solo and started singing again. The dude was like, for me as a singer and a guitar player, same type of badass vibe, uh, just musically skill wise speaking as like Hetfield or Chuck Schuldiner or any of those guys, especially being able to play lead and sing. Uh, so yeah, however you feel about their image or the vocals or whatever, you have to understand the context of when that record came out. And I was thinking a lot leading up to this podcast, obviously I'm fe feeling very talkative, uh, 2003, nobody knew how to rock. Everything was lame as fuck. And I think that might have been partially because of 9-11, honestly, at least in this country. Um, and I'm not trying to make a joke or like minimize any of that at all. I think it literally like killed some of our spirit. I feel like in the immediate aftermath, everyone was like rallied together. I remember that distinct feeling of like, whoever did this, we're going to fuck them up. And it was like, that's so dumb and childish, but it, it was like a real sense of unity. But I feel like a couple years went by and it was like, everyone was just broken. Like we got involved in all these wars and stuff. We were confused. Like, wait, I thought the dudes were from Saudi Arabia. What the fuck are we doing going over here? And we forgot how to rock. We just like got depressed and confused and forgot what was cool. Everything was like upside down. Everything that was supposed to be cool was not cool. And everything that is objectively not cool and retrospectively like humiliating and embarrassing, it's going to happen again. That was the stuff that people thought was cool. Made no sense. And then the darkness came and was like, no, a wall of Marshall Stacks and Gibson Les Pauls and doing $150,000 worth of cocaine is fucking cool. And you're goddamn right it is. So if anybody knows how to get a vinyl copy of that for less than like a hundred bucks, please get a hold of me. I'm going to attempt something here. Albert at Decibel, do you know where to get a vinyl copy of Permission to Land? Second part of the question, will you sell me... <laughs> Your vinyl copy of Permission to Land, please. I'll ask nicely. Uh, I'm assuming you have it. If anybody has it, Albert's got it. Also, you know, they say um, the music that you hear when you're whatever, going through adolescence, there's an age range, I guess, probably 12 to 18, let's say. The music that you hear in that time period is forever your favorite stuff. And that makes sense. I think we romanticize things around that time. Life is like super exciting and yeah, it's a like wonder years type effect. So hearing this at 15 or 16 affected me like the amount of testosterone on the album transferred directly into my body. And when I was listening to it earlier today, the same thing happened. I wanted to fucking throw a brick through a window, you know? I just felt like I was 16 again. Um, and I have so many memories like directly attached to these songs. Uh, I'm gonna make up a story that's completely false. I think the statute of limitations would be up by now. But when I say throw a brick through a window, like if this album was playing in our cars in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, a brick would be going through a window somewhere or something was getting destroyed. Might have even been a window at the mid-high followed by a bunch of explosives going into the principal's office. So, <laughs> uh, 
again, that's a made up story. Um, that's parody. This is all parody. But when I listen to that record, I feel the excitement and the rush of those type of things, even though I don't know anything about that specific thing. And I just made that up. So that's your episode for today. Uh, man, I, I felt like rambling and going off today. So thank you. If you made it this far, I don't know if I'll get another one of these in me and Mikey are getting together this week to practice. Um, Jeff Henson came by today. We're working on some stuff. Huh, what else? Yeah, we're about to go to UK and Europe playing download. We got a really good slot at download. Thank you, Cam. I don't know if you listen to this or not, but um, respect, dude. Hell yeah. Really appreciate that. Uh, and we don't really overlap with anybody that's going to, we're going to detract from each other's crowds. You know, we get to see Municipal Waste and Carcass and maybe Clutch and Metallica. So badass. Might get to see Danny Donegan. Sure, we'll run into him. Uh, yeah, next day after that, we're going to Netherlands, playing Into the Grave, and a few shows in the UK, Belgium, whatever. Google it. I don't know. Spiritadrift.com slash tour, and you'll see the dates. Um, I guess that's it, man. Thanks to everybody that, that wrote me after that last one. I'm going to read Get in the Van again, and... Uh, remind myself what the fuck is up all right thanks guys see you next episode <laughs>